Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Tavis Smiley. Tonight we continue our special tribute to legendary musician and my dear friend, Prince. We're glad you've joined us. Part two of our tribute coming up right now. The world is still reeling from the death of Prince. The iconic musician and producer was one of music's most popular and prolific acts for over three decades. Although he rarely did interviews and preferred to let his music speak for itself, he made an exception for me several times over the years. Back in 2009, he returned to this program to discuss his unique collection of three CDs, Lotus Flower, MPL Sound, and Elixir, which featured a talented young singer named Bria Valente. Good to see you as always. Likewise. Yeah. Look at us on that camera. Yeah. <laughs> Do we look good? Looking sharp. I'm feeling new sideburns. Oh, yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's working, it's working. And that black and white is, is sharp. When, when you're, for the book, the best selling book, mm -hmm. 21 Nights, mm -hmm. your photographer Randy was here. Randy St. Nicholas. Yeah. yeah, Randy was here. And I remember in that conversation, the two of us talking about the fact that you stay pretty much clean all the time. It's not like when you're in your house, you got on sweats and... Randy said that? Yeah, Randy said he's, Randy said he's pretty sharp all the time. Okay. Yeah. No. That, that's, that's, that's not true? Yeah, I sleep like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you know what? I, I, I would believe that except for the fact that I know that you don't sleep. Uh, yeah. You really don't sleep very much. I saw a sign in the back said... Uh, uh, Journalist, advocate, insomniac. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, for you, it should be the world's greatest musician, uh, insomniac. That's what it is. Props um, to you on your show, seriously. I, I watch every chance I get, and um, Hugh Massacala last night. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Joni Mitchell. Yeah. Man, it's just so enlightening. Well, I appreciate it's it. Inspiring. I'm glad you said that because I was actually, um, I never told you this story, but one day when you were on before, I was um, around town somewhere, and we had promoted that you were coming on the next night. And I walked past a group of people, <laughs> and they didn't see me, obviously. And I overheard them talking about you and the fact you were going to be on my show the next night. And one mm -hmm. of them said, why would Prince go on PBS? And I was thinking, they don't know that Prince watches, like, everything, but indeed watches PBS. Well, I keep an eye on you because, uh, um, you know, you have been an advocate, and uh, I learned a lot from State of the Black Union. I've I mean, you've sent it to me, and I've, uh, I make a point to try to check it out when I can. And uh, uh, that said, um, Dick Gregory, mm -hmm. one time I saw him on there, and it just moved me so much, I put pen to paper, and I, I owe him money now. Mm -hmm. Back to this PBS thing, though, right quick. I'll come back to that only because you really got into Unforgivable Blackness. Yeah. Um, What'd you make of that PBS series? Oh, I know. It's amazing. I... Uh, I'm in sort of celebration mode mm -hmm. right now. I'm just thankful to be alive. I'm thankful to have the friends that I do and the teachers that I do. And uh, I've spent the last year just playing when I feel like it. And I really look forward to this time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I happen to come across that show, Unforgivable Blackness, and uh, the story of Jack Johnson just moved me to no end. One of the reasons is that he had to deal with seemingly insurmountable odds all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if he would knock somebody down, people from the audience would get into the ring and pick him back up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so they could continue fighting. Yeah. And um, I just related to it on a lot of different, in a lot of different ways. I was, um, I've never spoken about this before, but I was born epileptic. And uh, I used to have seizures when I was young. And uh, my mother and father didn't know what to do or how to handle it, but they did the best they could with what little they had. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother told me one day I walked in to her and said, uh, Mom, I'm not going to be sick anymore. And she said, why? And I said, because an angel told me so. Now, I don't remember saying it. That's just what she told me. And um, uh, f 
from that point on, I've been having to deal with a lot of things, getting teased a lot in school. And, you know, um, early in my career, I tried to uh, compensate for that by being as flashy as I could and as noisy as I could. And, uh, you know, I just looked, again, I looked forward to this time in my life when I could reflect back on it and talk to people like yourself, Dr. Cornell West. I mean, when you all come over to the house and we sit and we just talk about heavy things, I, um, uh, I'm, I, just, I just become thankful. I, I don't know what else to say other than that. How, how did you... How did you get beyond, because I know there, you have so many fans of all ages, and I think there are no doubt some young people watching who might, who I know, in fact, not might, will be helped by your answer to this question. As a kid, being teased so much, and kids get teased for all variety of reasons, as we know, how did you grow out of that into, not just into confidence, but indeed into excellence? Or maybe I'll put it in the wrong order, excellence and confidence, but how did you grow out of that? How, how, did, how, did, you, how did you navigate your, yourself past that? Uh, uh, good question. I, uh... Uh, the first thing I did is I, of course, I went into self and I um, taught myself music. Uh, my father left his piano at the house when he left and uh, I wasn't allowed to play it when he was there because I wasn't as good as him. Mm -hmm. So uh, when he left, I was determined to get as good as him and uh, I taught myself how to play music and I just stuck with it and I did it all the time. And sooner or later, uh, people in the neighborhood heard about me and then they started to talk about me. And it wasn't in a teasing fashion, it was more like, wow, look what he can do. Mm -hmm. And there's something about um, having people around you giving you support that is... Uh, it's motivating. And once I got that support from people, then I believed I could do anything. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a lot of really good teachers. Uh, my uh, best friend, Andre Simone, his brother, Eddie, uh, I'm entirely indebted to in this regard. He used to tell me, man, you, your songs are better than anybody's on the radio. You can, you can do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I just kept rolling with it, kept rolling with it. Eventually, I went out to New York, and uh, I got turned down my first time, but I just wasn't, you know, I felt like Jack Johnson then, too. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't going to be put down, you know, so. Back to this excellence thing, though. Talk to me ab about excellence. I mean, it's clear that you are head and shoulders above pretty much everybody else in, in the world of music. Uh -huh. now, that's my assessment, and a whole lot of fans agree. We all say amen. Amen. <laughs> See that? <laughs> so it's, it's pretty clear you head and shoulders above everybody else. But, but talk to me about how we, who are not Prince, can aspire to the level of excellence that you portray in what we do every day. Well, everybody's talented at something. Right. Um, and that's what makes the world go around. We all need each other. And uh, again, it's about good mentoring and good teachers. I had a lot of good people around. The other thing I have to point out, though, is that um, um, how can I put this? My father was, he was so hard on me. He, he, I was never good enough. And there was something about that, it was like, almost like the army when it came to music. Uh -huh. It's like, that's not even close to, <laughs> he'd say, it's not even close to what I'm doing. And he'd play again. And I could hear it. John Blackwell, my drummer, he's the uh, same way. His father taught him the same way. We learn like that. We learn from being shown. It's, it doesn't come from books and just reading it. We need to be shown, you know. So it's just um, uh, having really good teachers and a bar that's so high, you know, Tiger Woods. I mean, I mean we can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to juxtapose, knowing you as I do, everything about you is love. You, you, you create love in the space that you occupy. When folk come into your world, they feel the love. Love is in your, your lyrical content. Your whole life is about a love of humanity. I'm trying to juxtapose how you got to this place of being love when you have this relationship with your father that obviously didn't always exhibit 
love. You could have been, you could be a very mean person now. Why, 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 why not? Well, I have a mean side. Yeah. Yeah. Let me back up the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can go there. Yeah. You know, I'm a fighter. I'm very competitive. I think from him being so hard on me that the one thing I got out of it is I understood that um, in, his, uh, in his harshness, he wanted me to excel. Mm -hmm. He used to say things like, um, don't ever get a girl pregnant. Don't ever get married. You know, don't uh, this, don't that. Uh, uh, when he'd say these things, um, I didn't know what to take from it. So I would create my own universe. Uh -huh. And uh, my sister's like that. My, um, a lot of my friends are like that, the ones that I still have, you know, early musicians and things like that. Creating your own universe is... Um, the key to it, I believe, uh -huh. you know, and and letting all the people that um, uh, that you need uh, occupy that universe. Uh -huh. To your friends um, that you referenced a moment ago, how have you chosen? How have you decided to maintain the friendships that you have maintained over the years? And what's your what's your barometer? for knowing whether or not those friendships are beneficial. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can tell whether they're beneficial if someone's respectful of you. Mm -hmm. You know, respectful of you when they're not around you. I find that uh, most people are pretty respectful in front of my face. Uh, when they're not around me, sometimes you hear them say some pretty hurtful things. and. I don't know if they think it won't get back to me or if I don't care or if I think I'm above it or whatever. But I remember them as I remember them. And we were in love then, we should be in love now. Uh, it, it's a hurtful place, the world in and of itself. We don't need to add to it. Mm -hmm. And we're in a place now where we all need one another. And it's going to get rougher. So um, I kind of. I kind of hope that, uh, I hope people, when they hear that, they don't think that I'm going to lash back out at them because I'm not like that. I don't, I've never done that. Um, I've heard a lot of things from a lot of different people, a lot of pretty famous people, uh, a lot of journalists. Um, a lot of my work is judged based upon my personality or my past work as opposed to where we are now. Uh, and I am. Um, I don't know, I just, it is hurtful sometimes. How, how difficult is it to live in a world, in the earlier point, which I take, it's a brilliant point, the world is already mean enough, we don't have to add to it, but, but how, how do you contextualize emotionally having much of your work judged by your personality rather than on the merits of the work? Well, one reason is because I like criticism. I like constructive criticism mm -hmm. from smart people. Um, I'm thankful enough to, or blessed enough to be able to say that Miles Davis was a friend when he was alive. Mm -hmm. And he was a wonderful mentor and uh, really, really funny, you know. And he could uh, critique something you've done um, by humor. Mm -hmm. You know, and out of love, rather than just you know just call you a punk and just say you you know just dismiss you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, he he wasn't like that, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, people he cared about, you know, he 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 tried to help. Um, when people criticize my work and attack my personality, it's. Um, doesn't help me. I can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they you know I don't know what they want. I, I, I've asked writers this before, and a lot of times they tell me that they just write for each other. They're not really writing for, <laughs> you know. Say, well, I really got him that time, didn't I? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, we don't, we, nobody learns anything yeah. from it. Really. Who, who, who's qualified? I mentioned, I want to connect these two things. I said earlier that you were head and shoulders above everybody else in the music world, uh, and most musicians, I think, even acknowledge that. Um, 
who's qualified, and maybe qualified is the wrong word, but it's the word I'm going to go with. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Who's qualified to critique your stuff these days? You mentioned Miles Davis. Oh, Miles, yeah. who's qualified to critique you? Oh, anybody. Music critics? It, Fans? It, other artists? Yeah, I don't mind critique. Anybody. If, yeah. if they do it with a sense of love, if they're trying to, you know, show me something about the work that, you know, they really feel is important for me to know. And I don't see a lot of that in journalism today. Uh, most journalists are just lazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? So. But, but if you said you like being critiqued and you love constructive criticism from smart people, mm -hmm. how do people critique you if you are so ahead of your time as you have proven to be consistently? If you're so ahead of your time, how can they critique what they ain't even caught up to? Uh, because they, listen, if they don't feel what I'm doing, they're going to let me know. If it's somebody I love, they're going to tell me they don't feel it. And they'll right. tell me the reasons why. And I can appreciate that, you know. I, I write all the time. I record all the time. I want to go back to Jack Johnson because he's still in the back of my head. I can't get him out of my head where this conversation is concerned. Um, who have you felt most often like in the ring fighting the record industry? Like Jack or the opponent? Oh, like Jack. Like Jack? Yeah. Tell me why. Well, because I knew I was right. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about this in our very first interview and conversation together. Um, you know. Mm. Um, there are four songs that I want to ask you about, and I did what I have never done before, which is to actually print these lyrics out. Some of them, I'm, 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 since the record is so new, I'm learning some of them. I got, got some of them memorized. Um, who, it, who gave you the lyrics, though? I've seen some really strange rewrites of my yeah. stuff. Well, I've I'm, seen one time they uh, said uh, the lyrics to When Doves Cry was, uh, dig, if you will, the picture of me, Marvin Gaye, and the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and know there, what? And then there was another one. <laughs> This person will go unnamed. Yes. Uh, she didn't speak the English language too good. Right. Uh, she had a really cute daughter, so that's why we was acquaintances. Yeah. <laughs> but she swore up and down, <laughs> little red Corvette was pay the rent, collect. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on one's perspective, you are either a genius for doing stuff like this, mm -hmm doing it yourself, distributing it yourself, um, et cetera, et cetera. You're either a genius or you are a hater of the industry, a hater of the way things have been done, ought to be done. Tell me the strategy behind your doing what you do these days. Well, first of all, there's no hate involved. I mean, I welcome the industry to stay and remain the way it is. I mean, it's actually good because, you know, when I'm sitting talking with somebody like Anita Baker, we can point to the industry as the way we don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we don't believe in free goods and we don't believe in, um, uh, y you know, 90% of the contract the way it's written now, the standard contract. We don't believe in 360 deals. Anybody that signs one of those are absolutely crazy. But it's a free country, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, the thinking behind this was to um, introduce a new artist to the world, somebody who is very dear to me, and her music, it, it's soothing, it soothes me. Um, I'm not a big fan of male vocalists. You know, um, usually when I do uh, uh, ballads, I use my higher register mm -hmm. because I love the female voice doing slow music. Um, I spoke too soon and mistakenly compared uh, Bria's music to Sade's music. I didn't mean that she sounded like Sade, but I did mean that um, there's a romance that is present in Sade's music mm -hmm. that, um, like the song, um, Love is Stronger Than Pride. It's mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful tunes ever. And there's a romance that was missing in today's music. And the best thing I could tell Bria was, try to do something that is not happening today. Try to get into a niche, because you have a beautiful voice, but you've got to do something with it that you don't hear. And that's what she's done. 
And it, it's one of those sleeper records that, you know, if people play and listen to all the way through, she got you. Why am I not hearing a lot of this on radio? Uh, I think it's because I'm not signed with a major label. Um, Target is not a record company. They're a distributor and a retail store and a very good one at that. 30 million people go through their stores every week. So they get a chance to pick up the Lotus Flower record. Uh, the beautiful thing about the relationship is that they're treating us like any other record company. They buy the same amount and they pay the same price. So, you know, we've done quite well already. If you had a station or a string of stations that you were the program director of, owner and program director, what would it sound like? I would just want it to be good music. Mm -hmm. And I'd want it to be littered with artists who own their master rights. Because without that, they don't own any wealth. They can't put back into their community. It's very few artists that do own their masters right now. Uh, when that changes in the future, you'll see more radio stations being purchased. Uh, you'll see airwaves changing ownership rapidly. Because you obviously are, you told a Jimi Hendrix story earlier, and because obviously you are the greatest, one of the greatest guitarists of our time. Man, you, I like this show. No, what do you mean? Hey, I'm, oh. You know why? Cause we just tell the truth around here. We just tell the truth. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a truth teller. No, um, you, what, what, loving, do make, what do you make person, of this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. What do you make of um, this guitar hero? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm mad at him. I hear it made like $2 billion, mm -hmm. and they came to us and af offered us uh, a very small portion of that. But um, I just think it's more important that kids learn how to actually play the guitar. It's, it's a tough instrument. It's not easy. Uh, it took me a long time, and it was frustrating at first. And you just have to stick with it. And um, it, it's cool for people who don't have time to learn the chords or ain't interested in it, but it, to play music is one of the greatest things. To create something from nothing is one of the greatest feelings. And I would, I don't know, I wish it upon everybody. It's heaven. Yeah. Yeah. She's one of the three records, Elixir. Uh, by Bria Valente in this new three CD package at lotusflower.com. Tell me how you found her. I'm going to talk to her in just a second, so you're going to give me the lead in here. Um, she says that she met me first, um, and um, that's what she told me. Uh, I say that I met her first. Uh, I will say this, that Morris Hayes is very instrumental. He's my keyboard player. He's very instrumental in us actually coming together. Mm. And once we got together, um, it was, we clicked. It was pretty easy. And uh, the most interesting thing about her is how rapidly she picked up understanding of scripture. Mm. Because I pretty much talk about that with everybody I know, because it, uh, uh, informs my life so much now. Uh, the other thing is that uh, she's really funny and she likes to laugh. And you know, Travis, I love to laugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, <laughs> yeah, he's funny. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I'm kidding. I told no. her I was going to say that to you one yeah. time. <laughs> That was for her. You got it out. And on that note, you can get out of here. <laughs> His name is Prince. His new project is called Lotus Flower. Prince, I love you, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Glad <laughs> to have you, you here. Brother. Appreciate it.